welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. It's always a privilege to bring the Word of God here. And um, I actually got this message over the last number of days. And then when uh, Pastor Jim asked me to, to step into the pulpit, I came to church. Actually, I sent the notes this morning early. Um, through to, you know, so they could, the scriptures could be put up. And um, right after I did that, I came into the second service and heard Pastor Dan, and he ended with my first point. So I figured somehow the Holy Spirit's orchestrating this. But um, what I want to share on tonight is I'm simply titling it The Blessing. Um, and the, the main scripture that I want to get right into it. Um, comes from Proverbs chapter 10, and it's one of my favorite scriptures in all of the Bible. And uh, we can put up that scripture. Um, It says, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow besides. It makes one rich, and God adds no sorrow with it. And I believe that, you know, as we enter this season, this year, where we're going to believe God for resources, We're going to believe God for freedom for our future. We believe God for, you know, an abundance and that the the, the people of the rock, that God's going to supernaturally help. Um, I want to just put before you that all of us want the blessing of God. And we want this kind of blessing. There is a blessing of the world which often comes, you know, with sorrow. Maybe a person gets killed in a, in a wrongful death suit or whatever, and, there's, and finances come or blessing comes, but there's sorrow attached to it. Uh, a lot of people who win the lottery, you know, they get this, you know, um, the huge amount of money, but there's whole websites full of how unhappy it makes them. And many of times it brings trouble as much as it brings help. And you know what, we can... You know, people can try and make money in a drug deal, and, you know, they may get the tangible dollars, but, you know, it's going to bring sorrow with it. It's going to bring maybe, you know, an overdosed uh, teenager or some, some terrible tragedy that can come with it, and that's not the blessing of God just because you get something. I want that type of blessing. I want the type of blessing that has no sorrow attached to it. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. And God does not bring any sorrow with it. And so I want to just share um, on what I've understood over these years. And the person who's really had the greatest impact in my life in this area, probably two people. One is Reinhard Bonnke and secondly is Pastor Jim Cobray. Because um, they've taught me principles about living in the blessing of God. Now I want to say I know that Pastor Dan define um, the blessing as the capacity to succeed, is what was shared this morning. And and to me, that is a tangible, uh, um, good definition. However, I want to take it a step further, that I believe that the blessing of God is a tangible, um, it's a tangible uh, entity or something that, that rests on our lives. You cannot see it. But it's an anointing, it's a grace, and it's, it's the hand of God around us. When you look at um, the book of Job, which is, you know, one of the most difficult books to understand, but the one thing I do understand about Job, number one, that this trial that Job went through only lasted about nine months. He was the richest man in the East, and he had double when he, when he finished the story. Um, but Job had this, this, this testing from God where... The devil said to God, he's only serving you because you're blessing him and you're protecting him. But what I get out of the story was how much protection we do have every day. Because the the moment that God removed the hedge of protection, I mean, everything just, he lost his, you know, he lost everything. His his cattle, his wealth, his, his health, his, you know, you name it. He lost just about everything in his life. And I realized how much God does protect us every day. We're alive every day because of the blessing of God, because of the goodness of God. 
But the Bible says that we as believers can press into a new dimension. We can go to another place. There is a place which is the blessing of God that makes you rich with no sorrow that comes with it. And I want us just to share a few principles tonight going into that. Is that okay? Let's pray. Father, we ask your anointing upon tonight. I pray your blessing would rest upon your people tonight. I pray revelation, understanding, wisdom, God, that you would impart, Father, your, your anointing and your, Lord, your grace tonight to the hearers, Father. I pray your word would find fertile soil, that, Lord, out of this group here, that people will come to experience the blessing of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the blessing of God is, Pastor Dan, he shared about this morning that, uh, that it's a result of beliefs that are acted upon. And that's really, like I say, he ended where my first point was. The Word of God is always a foundational pillar concerning the blessing of God. The belief that we act on God's Word, that we're obedient to it, that we do it, you know, you can never, ever get aside from that. And I just want to give you uh, just a few scriptures. We'll put up the first one, Psalm 1, where it says, Blessed is the man... Everybody say blessed. blessed. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His law, in his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. How many want that? That your delight has to be in the Word of God. Now, this is a very powerful Jewish um, understanding. Going back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. That's not going to come up on the screen. But I want you to put yourself in the place of receiving this blessing. This is what God says if you obey the Word of God. And when Pastor Dan and Pastor Jim and, and the leadership of the church, you know, share uh, every, every single service now, they say, if you just give us one year of your life, to let the Word of God sink in, to let the Word of God permeate, to, you know, on Sunday night, you're the hungry ones because you want more than just the Sunday morning. And, and, and if you just take one year and let that Word really touch you, I want you to, to just receive it. Just listen to this. It's not going to be on the screens. Deuteronomy 28, you can look it up afterwards. This is just listen to the words. If you fully obey the Lord your God, carefully keep all His commands, that I'm giving you today, the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They will attack you from one direction. They will scatter from you in seven. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land He's giving you. Amen? Amen? How many of you want that blessing? And so I, I want to just, you know, bring forth the idea to you that there is a place that every believer can live in the blessing of God. And number one, it does, it does require that we we have a commitment to the Word. We have a commitment to say, God, whatever your Word says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conform my life to your Word. I'm not going to do the other way around, try and bend your Word to my, my thinking. I'm God, I'm going to bring my life into the Word of God, and I'm going to make the Word of God something that is so powerful and strong in my life. I want the blessing of God. And the Bible says, if you will just carefully follow His Word, all of these blessings, it actually goes on to much more. Now, it, does, it is followed by what happens if you don't do that. That there are curses that can come. But let me tell you, as a Christian, the Bible says a curse without a cause will not alight. It will not land on you. You cannot be cursed if you're walking in the blessing of God. The children of Israel, you know, the Bible says they were a whole nation. And, and, the, and, and, and Balaam um, tried to curse them. The king Balak hired this, this soothsayer, this, this witch doctor in today's terms, and said, I want you to curse that nation. And when he went to try and curse them, God said, you cannot curse what I have blessed. If you've been blessed by God, you're protected. 
there is a tangible protection and a curse will not alight on you. So we want that type of blessing. So the very first area, I'm not going to go much detail because Pastor Dan carried it, he covered it wonderfully this morning, is the Word of God is it's connected to the Word of God and the Word of God is what, is what brings the first phase of getting blessed by God. And that's why coming into church and letting that Word touch you is the absolute first step towards moving into the blessings of heaven. Now number two, and I want you to take notes because you may want to go through these. When you say, God, I want to see your blessing in my home. See, I, I wrote a whole book called Unlocking the Abraham Promise. The Abraham Promise, God swore an oath to Abraham, which is a, a, a same promise is for you and I in the church. And that promise, God said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you offered your son, your only son, he said, in blessing, I will bless you. I'll multiply your seed like the stars in the sand. You'll possess the gate of your enemies. And all the nations of the entire earth will be blessed. Because you obeyed my voice. Now, so to me, I mean, I pray that blessing on my family. I believe in the blessing of God. I, I love the African people because the African people have a tremendous sense of his blessing. If you go to, a, to an African home and you say, you know, can I give you just some money? They say, no, pray, your, pray God's blessing on my home. They, they have a tangible sense that, that when you bless somebody that something is transmitted, something comes into play. And the blessing of God is something we can give away. And through Christ in us, all the nations of the earth can receive the blessings of God. And we want to be blessed to bless others and to be a blessing. Are you with me, church? Amen. Amen. So number one, it's connected to the Word of God. Number two, blessing is connected with unity. Now my wife, Lisa, is 27 years married to a fiery Italian whose family has connections to dubious elements in the Italian uh, families, what we can say. And, you know, she may only, you know, she may be short in stature, but let me tell you, she's full of fire. But we have survived 27 years and we have a wonderful marriage. One of the reasons is that we have made a decision we will never go to bed, you know, without reconciling and making up and, allow, and making sure there's unity between us. Sometimes it's three, four, five in the morning. Sometimes it's not easy, but let me tell you, it's a very good policy. Now, I don't just do it because I fear the, you know, Italian element in her family, which I do, but don't worry about that. That's not my primary motivation. My primary motivation is that I want God's blessing to rest on my home. I want the unity of God to be in the family. I want somehow the anointing of God. And I know that if where, there's, where there's unity, the Bible says he commands the blessing. I read this in my daily reading. Actually, it came up this morning. Psalm 133. It'll come up on the screen. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Where there is unity, there is peace. Where there is the unity of God, where there's unity in a home, when there's unity in a business, when there's unity in a family, when there's unity in a city, when there's unity in a nation, the blessing of God is commanded. Now we're looking, some people just, you know, they're, they're single issue Christians. They say, you know, well, God, you know, if I, if I just give money that, you know, I just like a stop machine that I'm going to just get back. Let me tell you, the blessing of God is multifaceted. When I'm giving you these principles, you can, you know, you can be sitting under the word of God, listening to the word of God, but you know, but you can be at odds with your brother or sister and the blessing of God does not rest upon your home. You've got to do all of these things. Or you've got to strive towards them. You've got to have say, God, I, I want these things. And they may be something that you're pursuing. But today, I pray tonight will be a defining moment where you say, God, I'm going, to, I'm going to seek the blessing of God upon my family. I want the blessing of God that makes me rich, 
that doesn't bring any sorrow. No sorrow with it. Amen? Amen. So, unity is the second area. But number three, Pastor Jim has preached about it a lot over the last, uh, I guess, a few months has been, you know, the whole story of uh, um, the ark being moved by David, bringing it to Jerusalem. Because the presence of God brings the blessing of God. The presence of God. You know, I can, I can tangibly feel when Pastor Jim pronounces a blessing at the end of a service here. And all the pastors do that as we close out and we say, I lift up my hands and I'm God, I, I'm so hungry. I can feel that presence and I'm Lord, I partake and I receive the, the tangible blessing of heaven. Because where the presence of God is, sometimes I just want to stay in worship. I don't even want them to go into the rest of the service because I just sense in the presence of God, I'm saying, God, just pour out your blessing. Pour it out, pour it out. Pour out healing, pour out your love, pour out your peace. You can sense his presence, and when his presence is coming, the, the, the blessing of God is released into your life. Amen? In 2 Samuel 6, verse 12, we'll put it up on the screen. Blessing is connected with the presence of God. 2 Samuel 6, 12 says, Now I was told King David, saying, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. You know what? Where God's presence was and David was kind of envious because he's like, presence of God's in that guy's house and everything he has touched is blessed. Everything that he's touched. And so we need to cultivate the presence of God. It can be with worship music. It can be whatever it is that brings the presence of God into your life and in your time of prayer, in your time of seeking God. But you need to learn to not only have the presence of God when you come into church, but also when you go back into your homes and your businesses and your places. We start our, and we're very privileged because we're a ministry. We have uh, uh, prayer seven times a week. I refuse our business to start our, our day without half an hour of prayer and seeking God and, and, and cultivating the presence of God because I want the presence of God to flow into my ministry so that the, that the blessing of God will come with it. And people don't realize that these things are all connected, but they are. Amen? So number one, it's connected with the Word of God. Number two, it's connected with unity. And number three, it's connected with the presence of God. But then the Bible says that, the, that blessing is also connected with people, especially with God's people. In fact, specifically with God's people. There is a tangible blessing upon certain people's lives. And I try to cultivate as many relationships with people who have the blessing of God on their lives as I possibly can. You know, my father used to say, if you sleep with dogs, you wake up with fleas. And he was talking about certain bad elements of society. That if you hang around the wrong people and if you hang around the wrong environment and you hang around the wrong type of people, those things will affect you. You can say, oh, well, you know, I'll, I'll help win them to the Lord. You know, let me tell you, watch how long you hang around them. But if you hang around people that carry the blessing of heaven, and it just seems there are certain people that whatever they touch, God blesses it. When they walk into the room, you can sense the presence of God. You know that the, the presence of God is carried by those people. I was blessed to work three and a half years with Reinhard Bonke. I traveled all over the world. We flew on airplanes. My wife and I, you know, we worked, lived next door to him, and we worked day and night. But let me tell you, when he walked in the room, you felt the presence of God. The blessing of God was on what he did. And so we need to learn to recognize the presence of God on people. Those are the people we want to hang around. And we need to become one of those people. Amen? That whatever we do, people want to hang around us because they know that what we touch, God blesses it. When we moved out here to the uh, Inland Empire, we actually, the first recording we ever did in the sanctuary was a recording for the underground church in China on prophecy because there were so many crazy things happening in the prophetic movement in China that they asked us for some real solid corrective teaching that would really bring forth the prophetic word in a true sense. There is true prophecy and then there's weird prophecy. It's crazy prophecy. 
And you don't want to get in this ditch over to the side where you're in the weird stuff. So we did a recording and we brought in two people that were very powerful. They were from Canada. And these people had never knew our ministry and we were, we were actually just laying the plans to move out to the Inland Empire. And we had our first meeting and, and the man who was bringing this message, he began to prophesy of my wife and I. And, and this is what the Lord said. He said, the Lord said, I'm about to lift the ceiling off your ministry. You know what? You can have a ceiling over your life. And when us coming to a church like this, we came to a church where there's an open heaven. We came to a church where we could grow, where the blessing of God has no limits, where there's nothing trying to stop it, nothing trying to break it or, or, or hinder it. And let me tell you, that's what draws us back again and again to the rock because it's a church with an open heaven. And we're very blessed to have that because there's many churches that don't have it. Amen? So the anointing of God is carried on people. And then people are walking in that blessing and you hang around them, you partake of it. Genesis 39, we read about the story of Joseph. Joseph was kidnapped by, well, he was actually sold by his brothers, thrown in a pit, put in chains, sent down to Egypt, sold as a slave. And he ends up in a guy's house. You know what? It's interesting. You'd think he's a slave and he would just be, you know, pushed down. But the owner, Potiphar, who, was, who had bought the slave, he realized that whatever Joseph did, whatever he was around, ble was blessed. And so he began to say, well, well, can you oversee this area? And suddenly God's blessing came on it. And this is what the Bible says about Joseph. Let's put it up on the scripture here, on, up on the, on the screen. In Genesis 39, verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. So in verse 5, it goes down and says, So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Now, it didn't mean that Potiphar was really serving God. In fact, he, we know that he wasn't. He know that his wife was wicked. Try to commit adultery with Joseph. We know that there was a lot of problems in the situation. However, the blessing of God came because of Joseph. Now, let me tell you this. You can carry the blessing of God no matter whether your boss serves God or doesn't. No matter what happens in your family, whether they serve God or don't. The moment you walk in the door, the blessing of God will walk in the door. God will prosper everything under your hand because you carry the blessing of God. The blessing of God is carried by people. And you can have that blessing over your life. You can have the blessing that makes you rich and adds no sorrow to it. And so Joseph... You know, he was put in prison again. He was thrown in a dungeon. And the, it was only a short matter of time where the entire prison was run by Joseph. And then he has these dreams and Pharaoh has these dreams. And, you know, suddenly Joseph's put into the, into the kingdom. And Pharaoh says, everything in my kingdom, put it under Joseph. Because what happens is the blessing of God will flow like that anointing oil from Aaron's head. It'll flow down over everything that you're over. Your children, your family, your business, your work, your city, everything else. You carry the blessing of God. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Praise the Lord. We can carry the blessing of God into every part of life. I don't know how much there's more to say on, on the next one, which is that the blessing of God is connected to faith. You know, I told you that I learned a lot from Reinhard Bonker. And, I mean, we're talking about a person with extraordinary faith for the blessing of God. Extraordinary. I, we, we saw miracles of God's provision that were just, just incredible. And he built his tent. It was over 400,000 Deutschmarks. And he said, Lord, I'm not borrowing a single cent. On the day that it was due, he was in Africa, and a wire came from Germany 
for the exact amount that was needed to pay off. We're not talking about half a million dollars here. From a lady who had never given to their ministry before. Reinhardt knew that something was there. We didn't have the same internet stuff we have today, but so he went, when he went back to Germany, he called up the lady and he said, you know, he said, lady, you know, you've never given to us before. Why did you send such a magnificent sum of money? And the lady said, she says, I don't normally give to you. As you can see, he had, she had never given. She said, but I was worshiping and praying in my room one night. The telephone rang and an angel spoke to me and said, I want you to send this amount of money to Reinhard Bonker and, he, uh, and to his account in Africa. She said, the glory of God filled the room. She sent the exact amount that was needed to pay off the tent. Somebody in, 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 in later on gave and sent a gold bar to him. No return address. Do you know how much a gold bar wor- uh, weighs? No return address? Over a million Deutschmarks. And these type of miracles would happen so amazingly in Reinhard's, in Reinhard's uh, uh, ministry. And I was, you know, when you're around that, and the reason why I... I, I really respect the blessing of God on people's lives. When I meet somebody who's really blessed of God, I try to have them pray for me. I say, just, you know, can I have a little bit of your blessing? Can you pray? Do you know what? You can communicate and you can impart blessing to people. Jesus took children and blessed them. I try and do everything I can to reach out and bless and bless and bless. In blessing, we'll bless us. Amen? And so, you know, when we started doing the International School of Ministry, um, I mean, I was just putting my tiptoes in the water, and, and, I, and I was flying to Africa to see my family, and I said, I'm going to stop off in Germany and spend a day with Reinhardt. And went to him, and at that time, he was doing a little booklet. It was called Minus to Plus. And he needed, he needed millions and millions of dollars. I think six million pounds he needed to to uh, be able to put one of these little booklets in every home, 26 million homes in the United Kingdom. He put one in every single home. He didn't have hardly the resources. He he literally lives on that supernatural waters of God. And so in my heart, I was was trying to trust God for $100,000, and I needed it by January, and it was November. And I, I stopped off, and we spent an afternoon together, and we were talking, and and I was saying, Reinhard, you know, I just don't know how I'm going to get this money. I mean, it's just like an impossible amount. And I've been a missionary in Africa, and I, I just don't know how in the world one can get this kind of funds. And as I'm speaking with Reinhard, the phone rings. He says, one moment. Gets up, hello. Star rattles off in German, and then puts the phone down and comes down. And he sits down again. He says, that was the printer. He says, he tells me he needs 2 million Deutschmarks by Thursday. Well, it, I think it was Tuesday. He needed 2 million Deutschmarks by Thursday. I just needed 100,000 in about two months' time. And suddenly I realized how his faith had grown because God was always providing supernaturally for him. You see, learning to walk in the blessing of God requires faith. It requires putting those timid steps and and, and, and taking a little uh, step out and saying, God, I'm going to trust you for this. And, you know, it's amazing when you start to take those steps into the blessing of God. But it takes faith. And the faith may start, you know, very, very small. With me, it was just at that point, it was, seemed like it was huge. But God supernaturally helped us. In fact, we purchased, 30, we, we, we purchased $36,000 worth of translation booths. And I put 19000 on my American Express card. Which my wife looked at me and said, honey, you better have heard of God from God. <laughs> now, I'll make this point. I am not recommending that. As I, mean, I have never done it again. And I have, that's, that was a one-time test of God in my life. And it was not Visa or MasterCard. It was American Express. Has to be paid right away. Are you with me, church? One of those translation booths is in the back there. Used for translation here at The Rock. We purchased 14 for the different nations of the earth. But you know what? It's brick by brick, step by step. Learning to trust God for a little. A little bit here, a little bit there. And the blessing of God is something that grows in your life. It's something that you grow. 
from, 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 from Joseph's life, it started in Potiphar's house, then it went into a dungeon, and then it ended up being a whole nation. But God didn't take him straight to the whole nation. He taught him to grow in the blessing of God. Are you with me, church? So we need to have, you know, faith to bring about the blessing of God. Now, that's number five. Number six, and we're almost done here, blessing is connected with the tithe. This is one that a lot of people don't want to understand. But I'm just going to give you what God's Word says, and I'm going to give you that my years of experience from the moment that I learned about the tithe and I learned about the blessing of God connected with it, that I decided to test God, that I stepped on those waters. Now, I will never, you, you could not get me to keep the tithe. The Bible says that we don't give the tithe. We bring the tithe. The tithe belongs to God. We give an offering above the tithe, but the tithe, the Bible says, the first fruits belongs to God. And it's not according to, you know, how much we give. If we, if we panhandle on the corner and get $3 and give 50 cents, we actually give more than somebody who earned a million that week and gave 100000 It's a percentage of what you got. If you got nothing and you got a dollar and you give, and you give 10 or 15 or 20 cents, you know what? You've given more than other people who've given a huge amount. And Jesus said, when a woman gave two mites, she had the tiniest amounts, like two pennies, and she put it in the offering. Jesus called his disciples and says, that woman's given more than all those other people that were dumping thousands into the, into the coffers. She said, because she gave everything she had. She says, according to what God gives you. But the first fruits belongs to God. And the first tenth of what God gives in our lives, if you want God to bless everything you have, you honor him by saying, God, this came from you. I'm taking the first part of it and I'm returning it back. I'm bringing it into your house and I'm putting it in your kingdom and I'm acknowledging your lordship over my life and I'm acknowledging that my abundance, my protection and my blessing comes from you and you alone. And the, and the tithe is not an afterthought. To me, it's just, it's a holy thing. I'm so blessed and privileged to be able to honor God with the first fruits of what he gives me. And let me tell you, it releases blessing. So let's look at the scripture concerning this. In Malachi chapter 3. And this is probably the most toughest point, so I just want you just to receive it. I want you to let the word of God, because... This is, this is completely about God's blessing coming into your future and into your life. It starts off where the Bible says, Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. Malachi chapter 3 verse, I think, 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, in what have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with the curse. You've robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. I will, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed. For you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. There's such incredible promise there. It's the only place in the Bible God says, test me, prove me. He says, I challenge you. I challenge you to prove me. I challenge you to test this in your life. And so whatever God gives us, I teach my kids when they would get, you know, $20 from grandma. All right, set aside the $2. And they put it in the house of God. And from an early age, I think it was David Rockefeller said, if you can't learn to give $10 on $100, you'll never be able to give $100 on a million or $100,000. See, it's a principle. You learn in your life. You put it into practice. And you test God. And you put that into, into your life. And let me tell you, if there's one thing that releases not only the blessing of God, 
But there's a secondary side of this. It's protection. There is a devourer in this world. There is a devil. There is one who wants to take what you get and suddenly he, you know, I had this money yesterday and it's gone tomorrow. Something, you know, is not making sense. It seems like I had money, but it's gone. It just disappears. And it's amazing when you put this principle into effect that it's like it just spends so much better. My daughter came back from, college, from, from university. She's in law school. And she needed, she needed these expensive legal outfits. I mean, you know, when girls go shopping and they go for, you know, executive wear, she's in her second year of law school and she's now going into that thing. You know, and I'm, and I'm expecting, oh my goodness, she has to buy three executive outfits. It was 70% off. And it was just the day, just the morning that we had that she came in. She got all three, and, and, I, and I came back, and, and, the, and she was sort of thinking, Dad, it cost this much. I'm like, oh, my goodness, that's wonderful. Because it's amazing the blessing of God will cause so much to come into your plate. God says, test me, prove me. Amen? Amen. Praise God. You know, the other side of this, and, and, and I... I'm not sure how much to share because this, this is a real story that, that, that happened um, of a man in Nigeria who was actually raised from the dead. Um, and it's a story, it's not a story, it's a, a, a real event that happened in a church in the city of Onitsha um, of a man who was three days dead. In fact, when he died, he was a pastor. God gave a scripture to his wife that woman will see their they're, they're dead, raised back to life again. And so this, this, this event happened in the 90s right after we had left Nigeria. And people don't really know, but we, we had an, a, an, an apartment on the compound of the senior pastor of that church where it happened. Reinhard was actually preaching in that church that day. They brought the body into the basement. The man had been dead over two days. And the people gathered, believers gathered around him and they prayed and it took about six hours, but he, suddenly he began to twitch, they began to massage his body and after six hours, he began to sit up and he began and he came back to life. It's the most extraordinary miracle I think that I ever heard and it was not really Reinhardt that really, you know, was involved. He never laid hands on the guy, but there was an atmosphere of the presence of God that came upon that church. We know the senior pastor of that church, Dr. Paul Nweke. I took Pastor Jim to that church um, to go and minister. We preached in his church back in the early 90s, maybe 1998 or 91. We went together and preached in that man's church. I know because I helped, I set up Reinhard Bunker's television ministry. I know the people that produced the video on it. But it's an extraordinary story of how that man, you know, he died and, he, and God showed him heaven and hell. And he looked into the flames of hell when he was there because when he came back to life, he was saying, where are my notes? Where are my notes? Because I felt like he, like he had been writing things down when he, was, when he was going through this experience. But the man clearly accounts that as he looked into the flames of hell, he saw a pastor that he knew. And the pastor called and said, can you help me to return the money I stole right away? This was a pastor who was in hell. He had stolen funds from the kingdom of God. And I don't share that in terms of, of, of setting doctrine or anything like that. But what I do share is that we all need to have a real sense of the fear of God when it comes to God's resources. We all need to very carefully handle because some of the greatest judgments in the scriptures are all regarding to how we handle the resources he gives us. And I, I personally have such a conscience in this area. And I want to have a conscience. I never, never want to touch anything that belongs to God. It's one thing to steal from man. It's another thing to rob God. It's much more worse. And you're not going to get away with that one, let me tell you. The Bible says that we 
need to be very cautious. And, you know, we may think, oh, well, it's just a nice thing to do, whatever. Let me tell you, it is one of the greatest signals as to who's Lord in your life. It's who's Lord over your checkbook. It's the, one of the greatest ways you can tell. If a person does not fear God and doesn't mind to, to take the tithe and spend it for themselves, then, you know what? They don't fear God in a lot of other areas of their life. If I see in, in my staff, they know that the one thing they can be let go for in our, in our ministry is if you don't tithe. Why? Because the Bible says it's a curse. And remember, the curse not only affects you, it affects your family. It affects your children. It affects everything underneath you. And the blessing of God is the same way. That if everybody in our ministry is tithing, the blessing of God permeates everything we do. God says, I will open the windows of heaven and I will pour out a blessing that there's not enough room to receive it. Amen? And you know, we want the blessing. We want God's blessing. And I only say this because in my heart, I'm, you know, not a, not a salary by this church. I'm not a part. Of, I'm, I'm a part of this church as a member. And I do this because I'm trying to impart to all of you the principles that will bring God's blessing over everything you touch. And let me tell you, this one is one of the largest and biggest and most important that you will ever, ever learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. We need to after that. The Bible promises protection and everything else with it. Finally, is the area of participating with God. And the scripture that I had shared with Pastor Jim last night was, he said that if he had to rechange the name of the ministry, if he had another ministry that God had not, had not called this church the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, he would have named this church the Little Boys Lunch Ministry. Because you know what? It seems like what we have sometimes just seems like nothing. And this parable of this little boy that brought his five loaves and his two fish to Jesus. So often it seems like that's what we're doing. You know, we're bringing what we bring in here and we're like, oh my goodness, Lord. I mean, how's this going to make a difference? But there's something about the blessing that came upon that little kid, the blessing that then permeated and fed 20,000 people, was 5,000 men plus women and children, but let me just give a, go a little further. Do you realize that that story, I believe, got into all four of the Gospels? And you realize that that story has propagated through the ages, has gone down the, the, the years and the generations and is reaching us even here 2,000 years later that we're speaking about a little boy who brought his bread and his fish. Now, that little kid had a name. Maybe it was Nathaniel or Joseph or whatever it was. But that little kid had a name. And that kid released blessing by a sacrificial gift. And he took what little he had and he put it in the hands of Jesus and God executed a miracle. And I'm believing God that that's what's going to happen at the rock. Over these next years as we take our little and we put it in the hands of Jesus that the blessing of God's going to make us rich. No sorrow with it. And God's going to do a miracle. And he's going to break it and he's going to feed a multitude. But do you realize the little that you bring into this house of what you're doing, that you're not just impacting, oh, well, I just did that and I, I earned it this week and I brought it into the house of God. But you realize that you now partake of everything this church sows into, that you, when you get to heaven, are going to have a share of the half a million people that get fed of the 142 nations that get reached through our ministry, of all the other missionary works that this church has supported, all the orphanages, all of the good works that are done in the streets, of all the souls that come here and give their hearts to Jesus. When you partake, you partner, you link together, you get a part. You will be rewarded. And the blessing of God will come upon you. And what we're doing as we are paying off this building is we're seeing down the generations and we're saying, 
we're going to seed into this church so that we can partake and partner with God. It may seem like a few loaves of bread and a few fish, but you know what? It's going to bring a church to a next generation. Every soul that gets one in this place, every soul that gets reached from this place and gets touched around the world, you're going to have a part. And you may seem like what you have is nothing. But let me tell you, a little in the hands of Jesus can touch the world. Amen? And so we partner with God. And that story, I challenge you to read it in John chapter 6. And just look at, look at that scripture and look at what, at what God did in that story. But you see how that little lad brought his sacrificial offering. And it's an interesting thing in the Bible that God always seems to say, what do you have? You know what, I'm going to look through our house. I'm going to say, let's, let's take up all the, you know, let's, let's do a garage sale. Let's, let's do something. I know of one woman who just, you know, decided to do laundry. She lived in an apartment building and she said, I'll do people's laundry. And she, she, when they, people say, how much are you going to charge? She says, well, here's my offering here. I'm going to sow this into God's kingdom for the work of, his, of what he wants to do. And people would just dump 10, $20 bills into there. In three years, she saved $42,000. And God told her to hold it till a certain night when a person came by that desperately needed that for orphanage work in Africa. And the Holy Spirit said, now, that's where it belongs. And she sowed it into that part, into the, into the nations. But it, it, it's, a, it's a matter of heart. And it's a matter of us lifting up our eyes and saying, God, we want to be a part. We want to link our hearts and our faith. And we want to bring maybe our little lunch. Let's get put in the hands of Jesus. And let's believe God for blessing. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. Before we leave and before I pronounce a blessing on you, I just want to make sure that every person that came in here tonight, that if you, for, for any reason, if you were to die today, if this was your last day on the planet, and, you know, some of us, we think, oh, that could never happen. I was at one of Reinhard Bonker's crusades where a man came forward to give his heart to Christ. He was 28 years old. And he accepted Jesus and he received his Savior, and he received new life by asking Jesus into his heart. And the man turned around and took about 10 spaces and dropped down dead. Literally 10 steps before, after he received Christ. He was 28 years old. And we don't know what tomorrow will bring. The Bible says today is the day. Don't put it off till another day. Probably one of the most heart-touching testimonies is the one that many of you probably have heard here at The Rock. And I actually wrote it out by hand, put it in my Bible, of somebody who came in here and his girlfriend, you know, said, please go forward, go forward and accept Christ. And, you know, he refused. Well, he wrote to us from prison and said, you know, I wish I had done that that night. He got into, you know, a fire uh, uh, shootout with the police and person ended up getting killed and he's serving life now and he says how, how different my life would have been had, had I made that decision that night and given my heart to Jesus Christ all of you who are, not, who are away from God you know that you need to turn and it's not a question of saying oh well I'm okay with God well if I've come to church that I'm a Christian so I, I, I'll make heaven or I'm a good person we know that good people don't make it to heaven not according to the Bible they don't nobody is good enough when you stand before God and he judges you and you say God well I gave to that charity anything else but you know what there's not one of us that can say we didn't sin and God will not have any sin in heaven there's only one way out when you stand before God's throne and that's to say to God God I know I'm a sinner I know I didn't deserve I don't deserve heaven none of us do but I believed, and one night, 27th of January, 2013, I put my faith in Jesus Christ, that when he died on the cross, all of my sin was paid on that cross by him. And so, God, I don't, I'm not going to get into heaven because of my own goodness. I'm going to get into heaven because of what Jesus did. 
When you understand that when Jesus hung between heaven and earth, when he was crucified, he took every sin of every human being on the entire planet, it was put on him. He paid for it. He died in your place. He never had to die. He was the only perfect human being that ever lived. But he died anyway to pay your debt. So you would not have to die. He went to hell in your place. And he's already risen from the dead and he's alive forevermore. And he puts before all human beings a choice to accept what he did and to receive him as their Lord and Savior or to reject that message. He made it simple. It's not based on how good you are. It's not based on how many good things you've done. It's based on what he did and whether you decided to put your full faith in him and you decided to make him Lord and put him at the center of your life. And so I want to give every person tonight an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you know you need to make your, your life right before God, and what does it mean to do that? Jesus said these words to a man called Nicodemus. He said, you must be born again. Nicodemus was a very good guy. I mean, he did everything right. He went to the synagogue. He knew the scriptures. He was a leader in his community. Gave alms to the poor. He said, well, you know, God, what, what does it mean to be born again? Do I have to go back in my mother's womb? And Jesus said, no, what's born of, of the flesh is the flesh. It's born of water. You need to be born of the Spirit, which means that your spirit needs to be regenerated. And that, he said, I'm on the way to a cross. I'm going to be lifted up between heaven and earth. And whoever puts their faith in what I do on that cross, they will be born again when you accept what he did for you on the cross. And you accept him into your heart. He washes away your past. He forgives everything you've ever done. And he comes into your life and he changes you. And the blessing of God comes to live inside of you. Because he forgives what you've done wrong. So I'm going to ask if there's anybody here tonight. That you need to make that decision. You need to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. I just want you to raise up your hand. If you need to make that decision, you need to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Tonight you want to make Him Lord of your life. But all, we, all of us here tonight, is anybody that needs to make that change, just raise up your hand. I see a hand over there. Anybody else? Just raise up your hand. If you need to make things right, I see your hand, I see your hand, I see your hand. Anybody else? I just put on my glasses so I can actually see you. Anybody else who needs to make I see another one back in the room. This is your, tonight's your night of salvation. Tonight, the blessing of God is going to come into your life. It started with me when I was 12 years old that I gave my heart to Jesus. Anybody else that needs to make that decision, just raise up your hand. I see your hand over there. I see another hand over there. Anybody else? You need to give your heart to Jesus. Tonight will be the greatest night of your life. You feel the presence of God here. God's blessing wants to rest upon you, but it can't happen until you make your life His. It's okay if it's a child. They can raise their hand. All right. God bless you. I got saved as a young child. I see your hands back there as well. Anybody else? I want us all just to stand in the presence of God. I, I'm sure I missed a whole bunch of you. And I want those of you, I'd like to have you all come forward and, and for us to pray up front here. If you can just step into the aisles, all of those who raised their hands, and if you didn't raise your hand, but you want the blessing of God and you want to be prayed for, and you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you just to step into the aisles. And let's give them a hand as they come down tonight. And they come forward. We're going to pray for you and transact some business for God. Just step out. Give them a hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else that needs to make Jesus Lord of your life tonight? You want to receive him. You want to embrace his forgiveness. You want to make him Lord and Savior. God bless you. God bless you as you come there. God bless this kid as he comes. God can use a little lad to break, bring five fish, five bread, pieces of bread and a two fish. God can use a kid. Anybody else that needs to give Jesus their heart and life tonight, just come forward. God bless you all. Anybody else that needs to join him? I like to pray, and I'd like all of us to pray and, and, and receive this. 
We're going to ask you in a moment afterwards to pray just to go and get some free literature and to have Pastor Joel to, to speak to you for a moment. But I'd like us just to pray it all together. This is the best decision you ever made. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I can give you the words, but you've got to put the heart behind them. You have to yourself. Each person has to individually accept Jesus into their heart and turn their life from sin to serving Him. You can still come forward. God bless you. Amen. Praise God. So I want us just to bow our heads, everybody together. If you're in the back, somewhere in there, and you still need to accept Jesus, I want you to do where you are, and then you can come forward afterwards. But let's all pray this prayer in joint with the people praying it up front. Say, Dear Jesus. Again, all of us, Dear Jesus. Thank you for tonight. I believe that you're the Son of God. That you came to this earth. You're born as a baby. And you grew up to be a man. I believe you went to a cross. You died a horrible death. And you took my sin. You paid my price. You died in my place. I believe that you rose from the dead. You're alive right now. And you're here in this place. I turn from sin. I turn to you. I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Wash away my past and forgive me for every sin. I thank you that you welcome me now into your family, that I am now a child of God. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Change me on the inside. I give my future into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Give the Lord a hand. I want to just pronounce this blessing. I want you guys to receive it, all right? And then I'm going to have you just follow Pastor Joel. And just, just for two minutes, it's very, very short. He's give you some free literature, and he's going to just uh, offer you what we call an SPT, a spiritual personal trainer, for five weeks that will help you to grow. But if you'll sit under the Word of God and you'll imbibe it, the blessing of God's going to come on each one of your lives. And you're going to be, you will not recognize yourself in a year in terms of the goodness of heaven that's going to change you. So let's just raise our hands to heaven, everybody. And this is the, from the book of Numbers. I'm going to pronounce some of the blessings of heaven upon you. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons saying, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. If you can just turn to your left, my right, follow Pastor Joel.